Hi, Cyril, how are you? I'm fine, and you? Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I have to really commend you on your, your launches for this year, but also um, the wonderful opening remarks you gave. It gave me such an incredible perspective on the world, on how the new generation is changing, and how, probably most importantly, you're really bringing um, ethics to the forefront of luxury watchmaking. So congratulations on that. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for, for your comments, you know, uh, all, all around and uh, everything you have said so far. And you know, like last year, you know, you appointed me as a kind of a manager of the year and the same was expected and for the very kind of you. So thank you so much for doing that. Oh, no, it's an absolute pleasure. And I think that if you know, you were to ask anyone, I think I'm sure they would agree with me. What you've done is really extraordinary. Um, You've really, you know, sort of reconnected Cartier to truly iconic creations. Hmm. Um, I think that that's what's so wonderful about it. I think um, Nick Fawkes, you know, he and I have conversations yes. sometimes, and he always says, you know, for many years I was I was hoping that we bring back um, CPCP, but he said what uh, Cyril Vigneron has done is even greater because he's made the entire brand CPCP by making everything iconic. Oh, that's that's so nice. I'm so I'm so touched. And the, but the the interesting part of five years ago. When uh, we said we let's come to Brink Cartier or where, where, where Cartier was locked for, for for iconic products, for beautiful design, sense of proportion, elegance, and 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 when we start to move out of that, probably where we start to lose our customers and those who love the brand. So let's come back to that and put the beautiful shapes one after another uh, in 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 on on in the full light. And the question uh, that that uh, was asked at some say doesn't mean you don't have any creativity. Or does it mean that uh, you are you're lacking imagination? And I said no. It's that uh, when 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 we when we are addicted to novelties, but novelties look déjà vu or not that interesting, then we're missing a point that beauty matters more than novelty. And let's come to that first. And when we come to revisiting the past, it also requires a lot of creativity to do things in a beautiful way. So it doesn't mean we should do only that. And many things have been done of absolute creativity, like the Révélation de la Panthère, or the Baignoire Picot, the Baignoire des Bordantes, the Maillon. They're really absolutely new and never seen before. So it doesn't mean that we don't have imagination. It's more respect to what has been beautiful and respect for what our clients have been loving the brand for. And the more we've been doing that, the more we see the clients uh, coming back to us and collectors and journalists and those who love watches to really come back to say, that's the Cartier we like. So um, it's uh, five years later, it looks like something obvious, but five years ago, it was not perceived this way. You've done an incredible job. And it's my, now my, my personal objective to own at least one new Cartier watch every year. How, that's how beautiful your creations are. I can help you for that, you know. It's, it's not the difficult just to, to, to match this goal. It's a kind of resolution that can be easily done. <laughs> so, Cyril, you know, I had the great pleasure of speaking to you this time last year. Can I ask you, you know, uh, now yeah. one full year later, what is the greatest lesson you've learned from 2020, uh, from the pandemic we've just experienced? And what are you most looking forward to in the coming year? So I think the, uh, the, the, the great lesson from... Um, from the, the, the pandemic was saying, uh, first be ready for the unexpected. And in some way the unexpected is, is, is both expected and not. As the professor Taleb has seen, black swans are coming. So we, we have to be in a world where something can happen. And in some way we have to be ready to something is not predictable, but anyway can be anticipated. That's the first thing. And in this moment, uh, the having some fixed plan or fix the scenarios doesn't work. We have to, um, so to be in more in the quantum mechanics types of, uh, of understanding that it's a world of probabilities, of uncertainties, of randomness, where there are things you can know and things you cannot know. And we have to see what materialize. So having a different framework of thinking is really, really useful. But the usual one where we try to draw a line, make fixed plan and try to deliver cannot work. So the flexibility is, mo is, is most of all in your mind. Third is that to be true to who you are. And this uh, Christ has been a strong revelator. You know, it's a kind of um, the moment of truth. And I have uh, written on, uh, on, uh, on LinkedIn a little, uh, little post on that. I say the, um, in the uh, Aristotle philosophy, 
the moment, which is also what can be called by the Greek uh, god Kairos, is uh, what is timely and what is true at that moment. And he said that's a moment where it's the space and time gather to become the moment of truth. And this Christ has been a moment of truth to say, are you true to who you are? And let this make sense to others. And we see those who are true to who they are, are doing pretty well. And those who have uh, tried many things, but uh, were far from who they were, in some way have been less and less convincing. So the three things, be flexible, anticipate the unexpected, tolerance of uncertainty, uh, embrace uh, the, the Asian values of impermanence, immaterial, and be true to who you are. So in some way, be true, be faithful, be brave and true to who you are. And that's very Chinese in some way, right? Absolutely, you know, and you perfectly answered what I was gonna ask as my next, next question, which was, what is the difference between brands that have been successful during this period and brands that have struggled? And you're absolutely right. It's about being true to who you are and you are an incredible example of that. My next question is that people are speculating that there will be the equivalent of the Roaring Twenties, that there will be an outpouring of joy and of course spending in say Q3 and Q4 of this year and moving into the next couple of years. Do you agree with that? Um, I don't know if we can really compare to the Roaring Twenties, but uh, what we have seen in the uh, after crisis uh, rebounds that there is first an, um, an, uh, an, an economic revi rev vitality that comes back and not even not going back to the 20, 1920s, but even to 2010, 11 to 12, where the uh, old government central banks uh, put a lot of reflation money in the, in the system to, to revitalize, to support the economies and system where it can be uh, damaged or, or disrupted. And, and this is uh, usually a strong period of, uh, of a boost for, for, for the economy in general and for luxury in particular. So I think we, we will probably see that. This being said, we should not expect it to be across the board and across the countries. Some again will, 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 uh, will rebound faster than others. Some sectors will rebound faster than others and some countries more than others or cities as well. So we have to understand that we are in a diverging world and probably some will come to euphoria when other will stay in crisis because until the uh, vaccination have been broadly distributed across the planet and the pandemic is said to be over, which will take about a year from now, then we'll see us again a big divergent. And after that, the, the, the part of say, what will come from there? Yes, there will be a, a, a reboost, but again, it might be different depending on where you are. So, uh, so we can expect something looking like a, a post-crisis boom, but again, we should not expect it to be uh, matching all segments, all sectors and everywhere. Then probably we will see a, a, a regain of interest for travel because when everyone has been deprived from traveling, then there will be a need to do, to do there. So, but it will be the same as before, I don't know. So anyway, we'll see economic boost, We'll see uh, a lot of attraction for luxury and we see new reattraction for, for travels, but maybe more for cultural travel, maybe more for also business and to meet people. So maybe more selective than before. Thank you very much. Um, when I, incidentally, I love the Tang Must. Um, I, I'm all, already you. to purchase one of them. So it's, it's truly a fantastic collection. When this, uh, when the Mustard Cartier was launched in the 1970s um, at the behest of Alain Dominique Perrin for Robert Hawke, it was meant to be a bridge to the next generation. Would you also say that this collection is intended to be a bridge to the next generation in terms of their style and even their ethics? Um, I would say the uh, the interesting part of the of the uh, to 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 re re revisit mostly the Tang Solo and to bring back to the Louis Cartier design. In some way, it comes to one of the oldest design inside which we put the most innovative movement with a solo beat movement and a vegan strap. But also having that uh, revisiting also the 1970s and the Tank Mast and some of the color dial are really kind of um, an homage to that period. So let's say when you have a long family and long family tree, and so you can find some beautiful moment at different time. And so what we find as interesting that collectors are equally interested to the Tonk Must solo beat or to the Tonk Must with, a, with a, the, the red border dial or the Tonk Le Cartier also animated version. So uh, showing that um, 
when we look at the past, it has to be beautiful everywhere. So the, uh, is it a, a meeting next generation or the current generation? I think yes, in, in, in two ways. The first is to say there is no tension between uh, heritage and innovation. It must be living heritage, living tradition. And from that, then we, um, of course, put very um, beautiful movements, innovations inside it. And so uh, that's a part that, that should be always constantly, that it's a living tradition or living heritage is to constantly revisit either in design or functionality or ergonomy or durability what you do. So we take in some way the oldest design like Tank Louis Cartier, where we put the most durable for the time being movement can be valid for 16 years. And what we see is that uh, in, the, in the current perspective, but I'm not sure it's only a new generation, it's basically everyone is having more uh, concern or more expectation on sustainability in general, respect for the environment, durability, transferability, repairability uh, than it used to be on the previous generation. But this is spreading very rapidly to everyone. So this would be, I think, a, a common mainstream trend. And so that's why we have to have appropriate answers to that of how to make our watches more durable, and being repairable, transferable. And this was um, um, a question was raised five years ago already. And I say when we, we, we launched the uh, Panther, a design which was uh, not new, but still as beautiful as before, offering free repairs for customers who had them in their drawer. And, and we saw many really coming and wearing them back with pleasure. But the question was asked to me, why don't you do connected watches? Because the new generation want this new technology. And I answered no, because this technology is too perishable. If we have a design can be uh, still as beautiful in 20 years from now, and I put a technical or on a tech module, electronic module that will be obsolete in two years. What do I do with beautiful design? We have on the, on the opposite to work to make even more durable movement. And that's where instead of doing connected watches to your iPhones, we did some uh, new solo bit movement that in some way can last for 16 years. And maybe more than that uh, with the technology improvements. So the answer I wanted to give to the young generation is that technology is not everything iPhone didn't exist 20 years ago and probably will not exist in the next 20 years. It will be replaced by something else. But the Tank Louis Cartier, the Tank Must, the Panther, the Santo, the Pasha, the Benoit will be as beautiful in 20 years as they are now. As, uh, and as Nick said, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the full Cartier becoming iconic and can be loved and cherished from generation to generation because they don't age. So we have to make all our effort to keep the watches as repairable as possible as durable as possible, and the aesthetic as relevant as possible for all generation coming. And probably in the next hundred years, there will be some lovers for the Tangri Cartier, because as uh, Hodinki had said, it's kind of inevitable design. It had to be there. It is there in our imagination. And if it was not there, we'd have to invent it. So it means in hundred years, we'll still be there. I don't know what will be the current connected watches, from, uh, from other American or Korean uh, makers, but I'm sure the Cartier design will still be there. I think your integration of the- so Also integrating the next, next, next generation in three generations from now. <laughs> I think your integration of the solar beads is particularly impressive because when you look at the watch, it looks beautiful like a Cartier and the way in which the UV light um, moves through the perforations and the indexes is really quite brilliant. Um, when you. I asked about the price of the watch, I was really impressed. And actually, when I asked about the price of the entire Tank Musk collection, I was blown away by uh, how big of a value proposition that these watches are. Is that intentional? Well, it was also a, a, a movement we started from uh, five, five years ago. Let's say, you know, let's give back more and more value to the customers. So the, the point is not to make it as expensive as possible. But as they perceive that it's, as it's both beautiful and, uh, and desired and also a good value for money in some way. You know, we move to have interchangeable straps and now we also want to retrofit on the, on the, on the, on the Ballon Bleu to offer that to clients. So to make watch constantly more durable, more beautiful and an affordable price. And so when say if we redo the Tonka Solo and we make um, 
what does the, the, the nicest design with the Tonkoy Cartier and with the Solo Beat, it should be at the same price. So those customers who liked it uh, would not say, well, we have to trade off something. We like the other one. The other one is, uh, is more expensive. Uh, so not the same price. And with that, we are sure we will uh, match a very broad clientele who will find it beautiful and affordable and reasonably priced. I think it's brilliant. I mean, I think I think the pathway to entry to the brand become, becomes even younger and they'll become clients for life, I would imagine. One, one of the things that I love of, about the Tank Must um, is that it feels genuinely genderless. And I don't think you achieve this by trying to create something genderless. I think the Tank Must design or the Tank Louis Cartier design is so strong that it is genuinely a genderless watch. Um, why is that important uh, relative to the customer of today? Uh, can, can you repeat the, the question? The, the... It is genuinely a genderless watch. A, a genderless watch, watch, yeah. Without gender. Um, it, it looks amazing on both men's and women's wrists, but it's not like you tried to design something that was genderless. It is just by its own nature, genderless. Yes. Do you think this is particularly appealing to the generation of today? Well, I think we, we see two, two different trends, meaning uh, if you look at the watches in the past, they were mostly genderless, meaning they, they were different in size, but most of the watches were, were, were the same. And, and, and why, why was it so? Because the more you come 20 to 30 years ago, the more the codes were, were specific to say how it is to be dressed and to behave if you're a man or if you're a woman. And uh, with, within that, then uh, watches were not needed to express your identity. You have a sign when you have a, you know, a suit, a necktie, and, and the way to, to, be, to be constantly in the day, or, or for women with skirts and high heel shoes, and, the, and you know, with the, uh, with, uh, the perm style uh, hair of the 1960s and 70s, then the fact to define the, the kind of, uh, I would say, stereotype identities were quite strong. But the more it came to have a more uh, flexibility in the way you dress and more and more casually and more things that can be, uh, you know, easily worn um, uh, in, independently of your gender, then people need more uh, signifiers and using other elements, including watches. So it's only it's in the past 20 years that the watches have kind of uh, expanded on, on some characters to be much more masculine. So bigger, thicker, more sporty, types especially, and those more uh, feminine, more uh, smaller with jewelry and such, and having a, a, an expanding range in there. And some remaining in, I would say in the middle, meaning with no specific characteristics of whether masculine or feminine. And so what we have uh, worked with is that the, the Cartier is addressing to people of character, independently of, uh, of their gender, of their origin, and, uh, and the Carte customers have always been those who have a self-affirmation, which is strong. And on that, the Carte products have a part which is masculine and a part which is feminine. All together, the Pasha is both round and square. So in some way, what is associated to both masculine and feminine can be both. So in some way, we have everything that help people to express their own identity. Are there some that can be just genderless, like the Tonk Moss, that can be suitable for all generation, all genders, and in some way, it's just a sense of beauty in there. Of course, when you have those like the Santos Chrono or the new Pasha Chrono, it would be probably more perceived as more masculine, which doesn't mean it should not be worn by women. But if women wear this one, it would be a sign of power for a man a sign of sportiness. And also the, 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 the Pasha 30 uh, with a dial would be perceived as more feminine but again, if worn by a man, will look very, very elegant and very stylish too. So now everyone can use what he or she or what they want to express their own identity. And that's where we have a lot of things to, to propose that. So in some way, we can have this, that masculine elegance is a sign of self-affirmation. And some part of masculinity are also part of affirmation for women. And in jewelry, the same. When you see an Alpanta collection, it's very bold. It can be very sweet and very bold as well. So we have, I saying, uh, what is new now is that we should remove the stereotypes and say men should wear this and women should wear that. It's not that anymore. We should have some part that help each and everyone to express his or her or their personality. And on that, 
In some way, the tongue moss is in omedol, meaning gender fluid, but we have many other products which have stronger character and combine both. When you have the pasha, we know with the, uh, the skeleton and the panther in the middle with diamond, it's both strongly masculine and strongly feminine. Sign of elegance and sign of power together. It can be worn by women and by men and it will express something different. So the policy, we have to understand that what used to be stereotype is becoming unstereotype. And then people have latitude to wear how they can express their identity. And what is true with time now is that, you know, watches are less and less used to tell time because you have time everywhere. So in some way, in some way, watches have lost their raison d'être, which was to give time with precision, but now they find another raison d'être to tell who you are. And to tell who you are, the design is more important than the movement because nothing will beat your iPhone to give precise, precisely the time and changing time zone right away when you land on a, on a new city. But the design will tell basically who you are, what you like, and what makes you who you are, and, and who you have become. So the watches are becoming the witness of who we are and who we become. That's very well said, sir. Um, you mentioned the Pasha chronograph, and I love how you said that on a man it's sporty and on a woman it's powerful. Um, I love the design of the watch, but Thank I you. was really impressed with this very unexpected luminous sort of light signature that's been placed inside of the flange of the watch. Um, it seems like a really cool way to renew and mm -hmm. give a, a sort of modern touch to something that's timeless. Can you tell us about why it was important to do this? Well, when we, when we reworked on the Pasha family, there had been so many down in, in, the, in the different uh, generation. And so we found that to, to come to the kind of, to, the, to reignite it, the, the, the new rebirth would come for what used to be the Pasha 42, rather, and, and then some part would have been the Pasha C as well, something in between this two. But then seeing that some of the smaller Pasha, like the Pasha 30, or a bigger one in Chrono, and there were even some, some of the Pasha Gol for things, which had been very flamboyant in the 1980s. And so we wanted to revive that, uh, the Pasha Chrono, that will have this kind of a oversized button and some kind of luminescence inside and some of light that makes you feel good. And also thinking that uh, post-pandemic, we would need this kind of energy as well. So in some way we can need either something which is very subdued that the, the tank must with a solo beat, but also something that gives you energy and the Pasha Chrono, I think will be the right thing when you say, when we can, um, uh, I think, uh, um, joyfully say the pandemic is over, maybe in a year from now, and say, ha, we want to show that we are full of sun and light again. And we'll have, by the way, a Jewish collection coming at that moment will be just amazing too. That's a great message and it's a perfect watch for that. I want to put it on and jump into the ocean immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you, you know, Cartier is a brand of truly timeless designs. You have, are the custodian of so many icons. How do you renew them without necessarily repeating the past, but at the same time, keeping them timeless? So that's uh, where the, the, the work of, the, of the, both the archives and the design studio come together. And uh, when revisiting, say, which one should we start with? And I said for the Pasha, as many had been done, it was difficult to say which one to our, our collective view uh, saying uh, embodies or incarnates the best, what is the spirit of Pasha today? Or when we did with Santos also, the same thing or the Tank Master, Tank Louis Cartier, which one? And we're seeing this uh, solo, we say it's been a nice watch, but say, well, if you look back to the past, the Tank Louis Cartier's design is probably the nicest and the most timeless. So let's come back from this one. Then question, questions are coming and say, what are currently the sense of proportion that would make it right today? And what are then the elements of movements, durability, repairability, that would make also a convenient for today's uh, lifestyle? And so that's where it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the work of the creative studio. That, and, and sometimes there are a lot of uh, work and, and, and tries and to make some volumes and to say, which one do we think would be the nicest today? and also the sense of details. And then we come to a proposition, we say that's with all our common knowledge with the common wisdom, we think can be the right to do. Uh, then how many variants can we, can, we, can we explore within that? So in the Cartier Privé, for instance, in the Tanque Asymmetrique or in the cloche, I say, can we insert some skeleton movement? Can we try in different uh, colors? And how does it look? 
And when it looks beautiful, say, let's do it too, uh, to offer something which is a respect of the past, but a new interpretation. And it's like, you know, when you take classic music and you reinterpret or get her inspired or when classic becomes jazz. And um, if you have heard some uh, Goldberg variation done by Jacques Lussier or some, uh, if you don't know if you're Edouard Ferlet, uh, who is a fantastic jazz pianist and has reinterpreted Bach in very interesting modern ways. Or Keith Jarrett has also played Goldberg variation with harpsichord. And it was quite interesting. Even if I found him too classic when he plays Bach, compared to those of like Fazil say who play Bach or Mozart in a jazz interpreted way. So this is the part of saying, how does this, 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 this composition, this first part allows you to play on it while respecting it, to be true to the music and to, to true to the, to the design and true to what was inside from its creation, but what it, uh, what it allows in doing. And that's where in the, the Baroque music is a fantastic example because many things were done to be reinterpreted, transcripted, and done in many ways. So if we look at that and say how it can be then uh, saying uh, respectful and true to what it was, and at the same time give some freedom in doing something. Or it's like making an, uh, a chess play, you know, it's always the same chess board. And many uh, openings have been, you know, uh, done for so many times but then the great chess player can invent constantly new uh, combination to make a new play each time with the same chess board which have been played many, 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 many times. So that's the part. First, come on the archive, on the, on the, all, everything's been done, try to find the origin. Which one can be the new origin for in the rebirth? Then what are the right sense of proportion for today? And then how much latitude do we have to play with it and to add things that make it new avatar that are truly beautiful today. It's a collective process, but I must say that the, the design studio do a fantastic job in this work of, uh, of reworking on the icons with respect and showing immense cre cre creativity in doing it. Because when you do the same kind of 100 times summertime, you must be really creative to make something interesting again. <laughs> totally agree. So um, Cyril, the world has gone Cartier crazy. Right, like the prices of vintage watches of London, uh, Cartier London, of CPCP, even watches from the 90s, uh, and of course, modern watches. Um, I think the, the crash is in, in inordinate demand. Um, and even the recent uh, limited editions that you created, such as the Asymmetric or the Cintre, um, tell us why do you think the world has gone Cartier crazy? Uh, well, I will ask you this question because it's been a, a kind of surprise, but uh, I think, you know, what uh, what we said before, that this crisis has been a moment of truth, and if at some point you are true to who you are, then you find your public. And so we came to a conjunction of having from uh, four or five years of effort, or what Nick said, to say, to make it Cartier entirely iconic. And then probably it was at a time when when you reflect and you think we need less novelties, we need less rush and you can say, what do we really care for? What do we really like? And then a lot of convergence come to say, wild Cartier watches are just beautiful and we want them now. So in some way it came to a conjunct alignment of planets that have to say that everything we had been trying to do, I think became true at that specific moment. It's a kind of conjunction that you don't plan, it just happens to be. Well, you're, you're very modest, but I think there's, there's two reasons from my perspective. The first is, it's really hard for any uh, brand to have its vintage pieces be successful if the contemporary brand is not also successful. So I think the fact that you're making such great watches today has an effect of lifting everything from the past as well. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is I think that um, watch collectors in general uh, went through a journey and they went through a whole phase where they were quite enamored with all things technical and now are in a period where they just want things that are beautiful. And if you think about it, there is no brand that has had a greater contribution to the beauty of watches than Cartier. I, I, I agree with what you say. And it's what I said before, that beauty is more important than the novelty in some way. And then when we come to many, many things on, on, on functionality, and especially at a moment where you need them less, and you say, what, what, why, why do we need watches? Especially when we also have the, 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 the eye watch or the technical connected watch that are very functional and very easy to wear. A question is say, why do you have an expensive watch if it's useless? Just because it's beautiful. 
then you come to sense of beauty. You know, two years ago, we had an exhibition about Santos in, uh, in London, curated by Sir Norman Foster. It was kind of Cartian motion. And he had made a lot of things with the architecture and design. And during the opening speech, we shared a part of saying, you know, the watchmakers have tried for a long time to master time, to think that time was like a, time was like a movement with wheels, and then you can monitor and control it. But in fact, it's more biology that, that mechanics that can explain how time is really working, because it means how do you age and how what do you become? But if you want to be really timeless, then design can transcend time, because the beautiful design don't age. You cannot date them. So it doesn't mean they age less, they just don't. If you say, when was the love bracelet created? Very few people know it's 60 years ago, like the Justin Clou. And we say for the Tank Moss, when we launch it, you generate will say, oh, it's beautiful. When did you make it? Well, it was designed about 100 years ago, but this one has been done just today. So this thing, if you want to now in today's time, come more to something which is a transcendental, then design and beauty is more important because design and beauty is what we need now. We need a bit less functions because we can have other alternatives. So I think when watchmakers are doing too much functions and not enough design, I think they are probably missing some part of today's time. Totally, totally agree with you. So being timeless yet timely. Absolutely. Cyril, can I ask you a question? Um, you are the third largest producer of luxury watches in the world. That's enormous. Um, and yet you're very modest about it. You kind of almost don't mention it at all. Is there a reason for that? Why should we need to mention? It's, it's <laughs> not, it's not, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I think, you know, uh, to, with, the, with the current trend and so forth, I think we'd get back the number two position quite quickly, but does it really matter? <laughs> Beauty matters, you know. I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, a quick uh, a question about um, the 100th anniversary of one of my favorite watches, the Ton Um You started off with this amazing 150 piece limited edition in the beginning of the year, which basically broke the internet and had people rushing to uh, the shops. Um, will there be any further celebrations for the Ton Cintre this year? Uh, not for this one. The, the one which is a vintage model uh, is a celebration and it's done. Uh, but we had other, other Tank Centre that we relaunched in 2016 and 17 and can have some interesting avatar in this way and can, can work on specific dial. So probably with the interest of Tank Centre, we would probably work on this one. But the one which was the vintage vintage, meaning really thin, mechanical, hand uh, winded, and not waterproof because the, the, the case is too small, will be limited to this one. Understood. So we have to wait for 110th anniversary or 120, I don't know. <laughs> so, so someone that come after me would say, well, it's time to re-celebrate again, I don't know. Excellent. Um, I want to commend you on the choice of La Cloche. Uh, I love this watch and have loved it uh, for quite a, many, a good many years. Um, you know, I love Cartier Privé and I love its capacity to, to revive these, these magical watches, um, which are so iconic. I think the day when you relaunch the Tank Aguiche will be the day when everyone will lose their minds and actually will break the internet. But in the meantime, why the cloche and what is particularly appealing about it? To, to come back on the Tank Aguiche, you know, you've been the second one asking for Tank Aguiche again. And there has been also a request for the Tortue Chrono Monopoussoir. So if you can send me your wish list of the one you would like to see, Tonga Gishe and others, because maybe you know, we, we had done our own list of uh, how in which order should we revive the watches. But if there is kind of this uh, collector's club that say, well, we really want to see this one, and then we will put in our, in our, in our pipeline so that they can come in a, in a, in a reasonable future. And so while a cloud show, it was a, a same say, when you have so many, and that was a point of Cartier Privé, so many beautiful shapes. And after revisiting the, the crash, the tank centré, the tonneau, and tank asymmetrique, uh, some part also on the Cartier Libre with the tank chinois, uh, we thought that anyway, the, uh, the, the cloche uh, was the right time to come. And so, um, so why it and not, and not it? In some way, there is not more reason than this, because there are so many beautiful ones that we have to revisit in time. So, uh, and so it appeared to be a kind of, a, again, timely because the reaction is really good on, uh, on, on what it is. Even if the way to read time is not that easy because it's kind of uh, slightly on, on the side, but when you put it on the table, it's really, really beautiful, like a little, like a little travel clock in some way. 
That's so amazing. it had this mysterious beauty, and uh, and we're very happy that it's it's received so well. Amazing, and and uh, Cyril, I will with great pleasure send you a, a wish list, um, I, a, a, and I will discuss it with all my friends who are, are Cartier collectors. Yes, as well. please, please. With great, great, great pleasure. Uh, you know, Cyril, I would like to ask you. Um, there is a special order program that Cartier uh, um, that is allows, and I think there's always been kind of a dialogue between customer and yes. and the maison as well. Um, what is important about this program for you? And this is a question that a lot of our readers ask, how do I get into this program? <laughs> so. Well, in fact, you get, get, get to the, the special customer order program through the boutiques and the, and the sales associate. And, uh, and there, there, is, there is no specific restrictions on them. It's just that uh, to be what is the occasion and what do people want in this case? Uh, we cannot make a specific watch for everyone. And there are some parts that we say we have to, to, to stick also with what the, the beautiful thing can be. So, um, so it, it always comes to some variance of, on existing design in some way or some, some slight adjustment. And we do also some specificities for our boutiques reopening, for some customer celebration, or sometimes say they want something specific. Uh, for instance, um, uh, la, la, two years ago, there, was a, there were two exhibitions of a Cartier a collection, one in Beijing in the Forbidden City and one in Tokyo. And in Tokyo was curated by um, uh, Hiroshi Sugimoto, who um, made a lot of things very symbolic about, about time and how stones take energy and they give you back this energy. So I say, in fact, call that crystallization of time and say when you go through exhibition, because these stones give you back their energy, in fact, you rejuvenate, you get 20 minutes younger. And he had made an old 19th century clock, which was remounted to work uh, anti-clockwise and the entrance with two big crystal as a, as a, to make the, the, the spiral it's with the, the energy. And so we made for him a special watch, a tonneau platinum, which goes anti-clockwise. And there was only one and just for him because it was very, very meaningful in there. So some of the, um, of the specific customer special order or just like, like that, something very, very specific for uh, a specific celebration or need or meaning. Others just to engrave some, uh, some specific thing, another to change the dial slightly or to make uh, some, some different colors because it's, uh, it can be meaningful. So if those uh, collectors or are interested, then they can come to the store. But if also if you're a network of collectors, your close network, if you say for our, co co our club celebration, we would like something that would be a specific watch with a big dial. With a big dial. If you say, I don't know, uh, you log the asymmetric and you would like a symmetric with a specific dial for the club, why not? We can do that for you too. It would be our pleasure. Amazing. So well, two last questions, sir. Um, the first is I had the great pleasure of attending the launch of Cartier Vintage here in Singapore. And it was an amazing success. I think you sold everything within a yes. few hours. Yes. Um, the, uh, for me, I think it's a wonderful testament to the fact that the Cartier that you buy today can be uh, the future collectible. Is that the intention of Cartier Vintage? Is that the message that you're trying to broadcast? So we used to have for quite some time what we call Cartier Tradition, which was used mostly for the, the high jury uh, event, where when we can find on the market or some, some uh, products first sale, we would buy them back, including some uh, mystery clock or, or very, very old watches, put them back in condition and either keep in our collection or uh, re-offer to our clients for sale. And they've been constantly uh, a strong demand for it. And that what we saw uh, recently is that we have in some way, few ways to look at the past and, and, and different categories. But, but the message, yes, is that let's say, uh, the, um, the, the beauty is really timeless. So whether you buy something which has been made 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 30 or now, the beauty can be the same. But we should have something clear, say true vintage, meaning we get them from the market, from that been really owned and worn for many, many years. And we re-offer them to those who like this design. And some of them, we don't make them now again. And then there's re-edition as vintage, like the Tang Centre, which is the same as what is with 1920s, but it's, it's a re-edition. And some which are the Cartier Privé, where we revisit the design with some new, uh, new part. And, and having all of them in a clear way makes something uh, interesting for customers to really have some power. We say we respect the past and something just for what it is, 
that's the, the real vintage, but we say we read it in the same way it was, or then we reinvent in some way. And with that, it's really that to say today's creations are tomorrow's treasure. And treasures of the past are as beautiful as they were at the time of the inception. And sometimes we see them with different eyes. So for instance, you know, the Tank must, uh, Les Mas de Cartier in 1970s were generally not so well perceived by collectors who thought that at a kind of a uninteresting watch. But now it has come at a collectible as well. And so it's also a proof that something you do now can only be understood or appreciated with 20 or 30 years difference. It's like in art, sometimes you don't see things right away. You know, in the 18th century, Telemann was much well more accepted than Bach because Telemann was more mainstream and being something people could easily understand and appreciate. While Bach was very innovative and sometimes was pretty a bit weird and a bit kind of a, you know, a, a, a strange guy making so many, uh, um, I think, uh, polyphonies or so many harmony that people will not understand. So if you say on the, on the um, well-tempered clavier, uh, or the end of the part, you know, when they have the two, the two, uh, two cahiers, and the second part, then has been taken again by Shostakovich in 20th century, and it's basically the same harmony. So prelude and thing from Shostakovich are direct continuation of the one of Bach, 250 years later. And in between, they were lost because it was too modern at that time to be appreciated. And so that the part that say, going to vintage and going to sing is say, let's look at the past with fresh eyes and we can see how beautiful they are. And it can tell us that even Sarah, there's something that looks sometimes too daring today, they might be look beautiful tomorrow. Of course, it doesn't work all the time. Sometimes you, you look at this 10 years later and say, after all, it was not as nice and something we had done before. And that's where the, the work we've been doing for the past five years say, let's look at everything with our collective eyes and let's sort out Let's, let's remove, and we say it's like coming to an old palazzo. You have to, to open the windows first, let the air come in, then clean all the, wall, the walls and find the beautiful frescoes in there and be inspired by the beauty before you make any transformation to the house. So this work on Vintage is also to have that, us and our customers, let's have the look at the past, all these beauties that came in there and how they inspire us for today and how our creation for today can be tomorrow's treasure as well. Amazing. Sarah, last question for you. With the incredible success that Cartier is experiencing, um, do you ever have concerns of an out-of-stock issue um, like some other brands are experiencing? And how will you balance the production versus demand in the future? Um, well, there is some, some part, in it, and, and Cartier can be unique and universal. And so there is some part where uh, we don't have or don't try to get kind of a control the production. Uh, and, and in this case, I think if the tank must sells very well, it will sell very well. Because in some way, everyone will feel something unique about it by, by, by getting it. Uh, but some, I think it's good to be in a limited edition because they are produced as a celebration. The tank centre, as you said, is tank centre and it's finished. And when it's finished, it's finished. And we have to understand that some things are finished. Uh, and then for others, uh, when we say we have production limitation to make things nice, and you know there has been a beautiful box with three astro tourbillon or, or complication watches. We cannot make so many, so we'll make a few. And this is it's a question of how to do things in a nice way. So I would say there are. I don't have one answer. I say there is some time where there is no need to put some production limitation. Some others where the know-how and what it requires requires to do it nicely to have it limited, and that's what it is. And others, when it's a celebration we do what a celebration requires. If you have birthday every day, then it loses value, right? Correct. But we don't, we don't monitor, I would say, scarcity in a way just to tease. We say, we announce from the beginning, this one will be limited because that's what it is and what it should be. And others is not limited because there is no reason to, to deprive people from, 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 from what they want. As far, you say the point is to be universal, but not being banal. If at some point you oversupply the demand, then it's wrong. If you try to, to push products on the market that the market doesn't want it or customers don't want it, then you're you are wrong. You know, the uh, luxury, the pathways always come from desire. And if you oversupply the desire, then it loses interest. So we should always have a part that we be careful on that and not pushing too many things that people don't want. 
Cyril, thank you so much. That was a great answer. Uh, thank you so much for this interview. You're always inspiring and I always learn so much from you. I'm wishing you a wonderful day and hoping we can meet again in the future in person. Yes, likewise. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye, Cyril. Take care. Bye.